DV Studio 2, this utility provides the programming for the interactivity features of the ViewStream 300 based products and also playlist scheduling for the ViewStream 300 and the 500 based products. On the, on the ViewStream 300 based products, the interactivity could be for um, external buttons, motion sensors, touch screens or touch screen overlay, um, barcode readers or RS-232 control. It also allows you to deploy the completed playlist the same as you do in DV Studio Lite. It doesn't, however, at present, have the media converter software integrated. So you'll need to prepare the content prior to using DV Studio 2. We'll take a look now at the different parts of DV Studio 2, but begin by looking at the interactive programming for the ViewStream 300 based product. So, I've opened uh, DV Studio 2 up, and as you can see, it's going to ask me straight away which player am I working for. So I have the 300, 100 series, the 300 series, the 500 series, and it's got a little drop-down box there. So if you're using a 500 or a 505 because of the, um, the 1720 and the other's 1080, and the 700 series. So we'll look at, we're, we're going to use a 300 series here. And that opens this up. We'll maximize the screen size. Okay, looking at the different parts of DV Studio 2. Again, the source part is where is your content stored. Now, just so we can get it in the correct place, I've chosen my desktop. I have the content store as a folder, so I can click on this and I can see the con my, my, my content that I want to play. The playlist window, this is where I'm going to drag the content to. Um, I have at the bottom, the, which you can toggle on and toggle off is the interactivity side, or when you want the content to play, which content you want to play first, how you program the buttons, um, how do you program the unit for RS-232. Uh, down here is what the playlist is going to be called, what track you're going to be starting, and generally we always leave this as default, start track one. Over here is your auto preview window. So to give you an example, we'll take two JPEGs. Um, we'll have a looping JPEG, let's drag that down, and we'll have a trigger JPEG. Chosen these two for naming because perhaps we'll firstly look at, uh, look at this part to say actually we're going to um, create uh, uh, the button modes of how you would make this work, but we'll, we're, we're going to loosely cover over these. So if you can see if I click on these, the preview window displays the image, so we can see those. Across the top, um, I can choose to open an existing playlist, playlist I've already saved, so I can re-edit that. Um, I can add a playlist. I can edit the playlist, which is the tab we're in at the moment. Um, I can create a schedule. Now, the schedule is all about um, you've got your playlist created, and you've got, say, two or three, and you want to play these in different playlist modes, um, which we'll come on to in a short while. Um, the tool section, where... I want to create the tools for updating using a USB uh, key and how to do those. Um, if you, the DV Sync tool is there to enable you to create, uh, if you're using an FTP server and you need to set a 500, a 505, or a 700 up to talk to the FTP server, this is the tool that enables you to create the configuration file for that. A data log reader, which is there to read the data log that is captured by the playback of all the files on the players. Um, so you can see what's played at what time. So we have a tool in there for this. An IP locator. So if you have a local network, you can look at the local network and look at any players that are on that local network and get their MAC addresses. You can look at the, uh, the see the IP addresses. You can rename the host names of these by using the tools at the bottom. Um, and then you have the DV remote. So this is the tool to enable you for you to talk to the player. Again, a three, a 505, a 500, or a 700 player, and you can control this through the um, through the network. Actually, or 300 if it's connected via uh, an RS-232 port. So then you have the deploy tab at the top, which again is very similar to what you've seen within DV Studio Lite. So let's go back to the playlist first. We're talking about having a playlist that's interactive. 
So you can see we have we have the two video files here, and you can highlight them by dragging over them, so you can or, uh, configure the files uh, in one go, or you can do them individually. Um, what we can see, we're saying, okay, well, we've got a looping video and we've got a trigger video, so we might want to have two one button. So when the content's playing, you press the button that uh, triggers the uh, triggers the other piece of content, or it might be a motion sensor. The motion sensor. Um, is triggers when you walk up to the device, so you need to configure that. Um, if it was a touch screen, you would have a number of buttons. Obviously, you have the eight buttons, and we can see those buttons and how that's working. So, the first thing we're looking at when the unit turns on, it's in a startup mode, it's going to play track one. We can see that's the loop. Now, if it's a loop, we want to set it to loop. Because it's a JPEG that I've inserted, you can see it automatically selects seconds. You know, I can't select playtime. To give you an example, if I took a, uh, a video file, if I brought the race video MPEG down here, if I click on this, um, it chooses in the playtime I want to play it one time, or I can play it two times or three times. But we'll just stick with uh, JPEGs at the moment, and I can remove this track over here, so I can remove. So back to the loop. I want it to play, well, if I'm going to play in a loop, you may as well say play for 99 seconds. And then what do I want it to do? You can see the then command. This is, OK, I've done that play mode for 99 seconds. Uh, I want you then to play track one. So it turns on, it plays track one, and it loops continuously. And it's going to continue to loop until an, another action is carried out. Um, we'll set the trigger file up. So this is the button's pressed it. Well, we need to tell this how long I want it to play for. So the trigger button is there. I want to tell this, OK, you've been, this button's been pressed. I want to play this file. I want it to play for 10 seconds. And when it's finished playing for those 10 seconds, I want it to go, so back to the then, I want it to go back to track one. So video starts, plays, you know, the, the unit turns on, it plays in, the, uh, in a loop. It's playing the loop JPEG. I'm going to define the buttons in a minute, but when I press a button, I want it to play the trigger JPEG. And when that's finished playing for its 10 seconds, I want it to go back to track one. So that's created the play mode. The next step you need to create is the JPEGs. So again, first thing I would do is to highlight all, both, both of the uh, JPEGs, and I would cr create, choose here the eight buttons. Our players have the eight buttons choice, and you can see it's pulled up the eight buttons down the side. As you can see, the default sets the buttons. If I choose button one, it's setting it to the device function of player mode play. Button two is stop. Three. Now, this is the default, what they call the VCD modes. When a, um, if you put a, a video file, uh, sorry, a video file or a JPEG on a 300 player, you turn it on and you have a touch screen, button one is going to be play, button two is going to be stop, button three is going to be pause. Now, we want to remove these and create our own. So we can do each one individually, or we can highlight them both, and actually then highlight all of the buttons and set the buttons for no function. This way it clears any memory of any of the current uh, button settings. So if I check it, I can click on track one, Choose button three, says no function here, six, they've all been, been set. So now I can define the buttons. So I want the unit to play, for button one, the unit's playing in a loop. I want to define button one, which is top left-hand corner if it's a touch screen or if I have an external button. If it's a motion sensor, and again, you can get this information from the application notes, it would be button five. But for this example, we're saying, when I push button one, I want you to play, and I choose down here, play track, and I highlight it, change it to track two. I click off. I can then choose when trigger two, when the second, when the when that triggered track is playing, I can choose if I want to enable people to touch the buttons. Um, you might say actually, if they touch button one again, it stops it, and it or it goes back to track one. I should say. Or I may want them not to be able to make any function changes, and it forces them to watch that um, track and that video. So it is up to you. 
the way you look at creating any button control, any interactivity is firstly, your first step is to create yourself a flow diagram. And that flow diagram must have all the details of how long you want the video file to or the track to play for, um, if you push a button, which button needs to go where, and then after that's played, you go on to the next track. So it's about multiple touch or multiple button actions. Every single track or every file that you want to play can have up to eight selected buttons. Or an, and you can have up to a thousand go-to commands. They're all about go-to commands. You're saying, when I play, I want you to go to this file, etc. Um, so that's completed. I can go and save that playlist. So I can go in at the top and say, actually, I want to save it as. I choose the location. So again, go to my desktop. Um, I'm going to call this a test. Click save. That is saved, and it's called the playlist test.pll. While we're on this section, it's may, we may as well cover the, um, the RS-232 because it is an interactive um, uh, feature. Um, so external buttons, motion sensors we've covered, touch screens are all programmed through the button control. Um, barcode readers, or RS-232, you may have a control system, Crestron AMX, and you want to send code to it that triggers a particular track. So for this example, we say actually or for, for this trigger track, um, when I scan a product or scan a barcode or send a RS-232 command, I need to go to this RS-232 tab down here. And in this, white, in this uh, window box here, I need to enter the code. So if the code was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, I will assign that. So that is now assigned to trigger 2. If I click on loop, you'll see nothing in the box here. If I go back to the trigger, you'll see this number has um, now been assigned to it. And we can assign more numbers. It could be 0001. We can add that one to it. So if it's on a barcode project um, where you're, you have a barcode reader connected to, uh, a, a, say, a 300 series player, and you scan the product, and it picks up that barcode number, what's going to happen? It's going to say, play this file straight away. Um, and you could have multiple files uh, that all have their own individual barcodes. And you, when you, when that command, when that barcode is scanned or that number is generated and it matches um, the numbers that's been entered against a file, it will play that automatically. So that's how you would go about creating the RS-232 control. There is um, a code or um, uh, RS-232 codes for um, use with like Crestron systems, which will be for play, stop, pause, and you'll find them in the application notes of how to program um, to use for RS-232. So those are in there. So that's your button control and your RS-232. So now with them being done, um, what we need to do is we need to schedule a playback. So the playlist is created. We may create a second playlist or a third playlist. We might have multiple playlists. Um, if I go to the schedule tab, we can see here um, the, the next stage for me is to insert the actual playlist. So scheduling is a choice where all our players, whether it's a 300, a 500, a 700, and the video flyer range, have built-in clocks. You configure the date and the time on each, on each um, uh, player or video flyer. Um, so the date and time is recognized. So this could be a standalone box been put into a location. And you may, for example, want a piece of content, if it's in once mode, to start on a particular day, um, on a, sorry, on a specific date at a specific time. And it will keep playing that um, until another playlist has been set to start to play on a specific date and time. Another mode is to play for daily, which means you can start the playlist every day. So Monday through to Sunday, um, you can have the playlist starting um, at a specific time, as you can see up here. So this means on uh, you, if you've got two, if you've got an AM and PM playlist, you can set one playlist to start and play from nine um, from one minute past uh, midnight through to midday, and then the second playlist to play for the rest of the day. And then the next day, it'll come round and it picks up the first playlist again. So the way we do this is we add a playlist. 
So I need to go to the playlist I've created. I have that within my Ian box. I've got the test playlist. I've inserted that. It's telling me this is my startup playlist. It's put it in my action window over here. And for this example, I want to, uh, I could choose weekly. And I could say on a Friday, so this is a specific day a week, I want on a Friday, I want to play this playlist because I've got a playlist for the Thursday and the Wednesday and the Tuesday. Um, or I can choose a monthly schedule. Monthly, a particular day in the month. So on the first of every month, we have a new playlist. And the way we do this is if we, since we choose a daily playlist, and we're going to say uh, daily playlist, we're going to use this one here, and I want that playlist to start playing at uh, this specific one at 900 hours. And 24 seconds. Um, I'm going to start playing this on a daily, and we'll start it from the... Uh, and I click Add. You can see it's put it into the playlist mode that my task one, so daily, every day, I want at 9 o'clock to play this particular playlist. So on there, we'd have a second playlist, a third playlist, and we can build up a full schedule. Once that's completed, you continue just to go through to deployment. So your deployment button, I have to, do I want to make changes and save it? Yes, I do want to save it. Again, I'll save it in my in folder. This is the schedule in so the, for the projects. Uh, essentially, actually put it on the desktop. There we go, Ian. Okay, and I'll save this. So it's taken me through. Now, what we can see here, show files list will show me the files that it's going to deploy. So here, if I want to deploy it to a CF card, it's going to deploy, sorry, a uh, test to playlist, the files, a schedule any file, a barcode any file, because there's RS-232 commands in there, and also the project file. So you understand, a player, when it turns on, the first thing it looks for is a PRJ file. This tells it that it has a project file, and there is a project behind it. After it's finished, once it knows there is a project, it will look for a schedule any file. This tells it that there will be playlists. And then if there's multiple playlists, what time these playlists play. Once it knows what playlist it should be playing, it will go to the PLL file, which is where we just created all the command structure for when it needs to play, what happens when you press a button. So this is the playlist file. And then you have the files that it's going to play. If I was deploying it to a USB drive here, um, let's say, for instance, we're going to deploy this to a USB key. Um, to choose onto, sorry, one second. Let's stop. Choose. OK, cancel that for a minute. You'll see that it adds the additional files that are required for it to create the USB key. So you can see these all being generated. If I want to deploy it to a player, again, I need the IP address, OK? Don't know the IP address of the player. So what I can do is I can cancel that, go to the Tools section, go to my IP locator, find the player I want to deploy it to, this one here, double click. I can see the IP address is 67. And go back to the Deploy window, go to the Player window. It's put 67 in there. I need to enter the username and password. And that will enable me to then go in and actually um, send the files to those players. So you have various ways of deploying the content. If we deploy it to the flash card, or sorry, to, the, to a flash card or the hard drive on your computer, so we can choose completed content. Let's go back to the in command. We can choose that, and we can deploy. You can see the eight files were deployed. Again, we could deploy it to an FTP server. Again, that's the FTP server where your players are connecting to to pick up that content. 